What's going on? I'm glad to see you made it this far. I uh, apologize for the lighting. We're still running on limited power here. I'm running on batteries and just, you know, candle power, as you can see back here behind me. Uh, so the lighting's a little low, but we're going to do the best we can. I wanted to give you guys a situation report on what happened uh, during the firefight, but also if you haven't seen any of the other uh, little short videos that I've made about this, that essentially there's been an EMP attack here in the United States or some kind of attack that knocked out the entire power grid. Most people just call it the event now because no one's really sure 100% what it was. Uh, but early on, I saw a flash of light in the sky. It was around 2 p.m. I saw a flash of light in the sky. I heard a big boom and suddenly I went inside. All the power was out and pretty much from that day forward, all hell's been breaking loose. I mean, I've seen the worst of people. I've seen some instances of the best of people, but very few, very few. Most people that you come into contact with that you don't know out on the road uh, want to kill you and they want to take your stuff at very least, which could kill you in the long run. So uh, you have to really be careful when you're traveling around. And I found that out with a group of my guys. We had three other guys with us in the back of my truck. We went out, we got ambushed and we got separated. I went ahead and busted through. They bailed out and ran up in the woods. I busted through and uh, got out of there, went over to, to our other property. My wife and I own another property that we were actually developing just in the event of having to be more self-sufficient and stuff like that. Really, that was the intention of it. But uh, now looking at it, it's really the perfect survivalist off-grid setup. So uh, I went over there and stayed basically just kind of floated around. I stayed in one of the old mobile homes that we have on the property and it was a real terrible time. I stayed in a, I actually made a teepee a while back just kind of for fun. And I stayed in the teepee for a few days. I was trying to just kind of keep moving around and I actually dug a foxhole at one point and made a little lid that I could close down over the top of it covered with leaves. That way me and my dog could get down in that little foxhole and we could sleep down there. And a few nights we slept down there. Uh, not only was it a little bit warmer because it was under the ground, uh, but I, I had some people moving around on me on my property and, you know, you got to get some sleep sometimes. So that was one of the biggest things that I wasn't prepared for was just the complete lack of sleep. Uh, you know, you start, you know, your mind starts playing tricks on you when you've only had a couple of hours sleep for weeks at a time and you're living on very limited uh, food intake. You know, I had like, I think at one point I had four or five cans of canned vegetables and, and can, I had a canned, uh, corned beef hash, uh, a couple of beans. I had like two cans of beans and some mixed vegetables. And I was eating basically a quarter can a day of that stuff. So, you know, I'm a 180 pound guy. I need more calories than that, uh, just to do the minimal, but basically, uh, you know, I probably lost 20 pounds. Uh, I'm guessing. I don't know. I haven't looked at a scale, but I'm guessing because my pants are all sagging and falling off of me now uh, after this whole ordeal. But yeah, I got separated. I had to go over and bug out. I couldn't get back to my neighborhood because m multiple other reasons. I mean, every time I tried to go out on a road uh, and do any kind of travel in my vehicle, I was almost immediately turned in a different direction because of roadblocks and because of just stuff in the road, broken down cars and stuff like that. You don't never know when you're approaching a situation from a long ways away, if those broken down cars were just left there and burned up some, in some cases I saw burned up cars, like people went out and set them on fire and stuff. I don't know what, what all happened, but they were immovable. I couldn't even push through them with my truck. So, uh, you didn't know if that was a roadblock or that someone else had put together there just to, just to come out and ambush you or what. So it was a very sketch, uh, sketchy situation. And in the end, I ended up having to leave my truck. Like, I don't know, it's probably five miles away from here parked up in the woods, hidden under some limbs and stuff that I cut down, you know, quickly so that I could hide the thing the best I can. But I don't have my truck right now. I had to walk the last five miles with my dog through all kinds of stuff because we just couldn't travel the roads anymore. And I mentioned that in the last video, I talked about how traveling in the ditches became the new, kind of the new highway or the new walkway. Anyway, you can't drive a car down through there anything, maybe a motorcycle, but that would make a lot of noise. And so I just went real slow and steady and went through the ditch. And basically I, I got to a point where I made radio contact with my group. And after that, we, we formed a plan, uh, to get rid of these freeloaders that were basically, 
the story goes is these people were from like three, three or four neighborhoods over, I don't know, let's say five or 10 miles down the road from where we live. And uh, they just hadn't prepared. So they came over here basically trying to leech off of our neighborhood and our supplies. And they'd never opened fire or anything, but they were armed and they were organized to the point where our people were really worried about it and we couldn't go through. They weren't, they weren't allowing us to leave our neighborhood. So we couldn't go out and resupply. And so it was a real big deal. And it was about, I don't know, a week they had my neighborhood, maybe two weeks, they had the neighborhood pinned down, completely pinned down and cut off. And so I couldn't make radio contact until like the last few days. I got over there close enough, made radio contact, and they didn't even know I was alive. My neighborhood, my wife, everybody thought I was dead because they never saw me again. Uh, the two other guys that ended up living, so there were three people in the back of my truck that split that day. And I told you in one of the videos that I found some blood and I knew somebody was seriously wounded. And well, it turns out Paul didn't make it. Uh, he took a shot just below the rib, rib cage and it was like a gut shot. It didn't hit any super vital organs, but uh, it turns out that that bile from your stomach and stuff can get into your bloodstream. And he basically died of a blood infection is what they're telling me. I don't know, I'm not a doctor or anything like that, but it's one of those things that uh, if you get shot in the stomach, you may not die instantly, but you're probably gonna eventually die if you don't get some sort of a medical attention on that. So unfortunately, Paul's no longer with us and that's, that's terrible news uh, because he had a wife and kid. So, and he was a good guy, you know, so I feel compelled to try to help out and do what I can to, you know, provide and help provide for the neighborhood and his wife included just because, you know, that was the deal we all had. You know, if something happened to any of us, we would, you know, try to kick in and take care of the other person's family for him. But yeah, it's real sad. He was a good guy, a prepper, uh, you know, just one of those things when everything, when the bullet started flying, he ran into the woods and I guess he took one in the gut and, you know, I guess he lived for three or four days after that. And, but he was in agonizing pain. The guys said the other guys, uh, Jeff and Chuck were the two that got back. And they told my wife and the other people in the group that they thought I was dead. And, you know, I don't blame them. I'm not mad at them or anything, but uh, still. Uh, so, yeah, anyways, I made radio contact three days ago, I guess it was. And we planned the ambush and it was early morning. That just as I said in the last video, we were going to go ahead and do a pincer type move early in the morning. And so that's what we did. I engaged from the top of the hill. My neighborhood engaged almost virtually simultaneously. Uh, one of the things in our strategy was that uh, the people in my neighborhood had been looking out and watching this group of marauders for several days. So we knew kind of who was the, who were the movers and shakers of the group? Who were the people that were giving the orders? And there were three people, one guy that was kind of the main leader of the group. And so clearly those were our primary targets. And certainly, just as we planned, uh, once those three people were neutralized, all the rest of them jumped in their vehicles and, and got out of there as fast as they could. A lot of them left their guns and stuff behind. So obviously, we went out there and we picked up the guns and ammo and other stuff they left behind, radios and stuff like that. And it turns out they were using an FRS radio frequency. So my neighborhood, one of their kids had one of these FRS radios. So they were able to listen in and monitor to all the communications of this other group. Meanwhile, we're on a MERS frequency. So uh, theoretically, someone else could have tapped in with some sort of a ham radio and, and gotten to our communications as well, but they didn't because most people are on the FRS and our neighborhood is mostly on the MERS. So anyways, that turned out to be a really great advantage. And I'm really glad that I got those MERS radios all those time, all that time ago, because otherwise, uh, if I had tried to contact my wife on FRS, they would have heard me talking. They would have heard us planning about the ambush and stuff. So clearly you got to be able to communicate in a private manner or other people can hear exactly what you're saying. And then they're going to know they're going to be one step ahead of you the whole time. But yes, thankfully I, I am very joyous that, you know, right before the end of the year, uh, I think this is the last day of the year, or maybe tomorrow's the last day of the year. I'm not really sure because again, I don't really keep track of time anymore, but I know we're coming up to the end of the year and this is just great news to be able to be home with my wife at my own homestead where I have my supplies and my things. And I, I've been eating like a king since I got home two days ago. So anyhow, all went well. 
it took a coordinated effort, but we were able to thwart the marauders and now we're opened up. The roads opened up at least in front of our area. And a lot of people, uh, that's one thing I noticed uh, when I was out separated and I've been telling my group to watch out for this, that a lot of neighborhoods like ours that, you know, they butt up to a main road. So what's kind of a common occurrence is a lot of these neighborhoods are charging what we're calling a highway toll where they want you to give them something or they're not going to let you. And it depends what you have and who they are. You know, some, some of these neighborhoods want you to give them everything. And we, we don't, we have a policy of not giving away anything like that under duress. So we try to avoid those, those roads, I guess. So we're very limited on where we can go and get supplies and stuff like that. And, um, I think it's going to take a bigger group. We're not going to be able to go out anymore in groups of just four people. It was me in the truck, me and my dog up in the cab of the truck and three guys in the back of the truck. That's not going to cut it because we're too, uh, singled out that way. What we needed to have was like, I don't know, a couple of guys on motorcycles and maybe, maybe two trucks with armed people inside of them. And if that would have happened, uh, just sheerly the numbers of the engagement would have been a lot more in our favor. So uh, you have to think a lot more guerrilla warfare style. And like I was saying in the last video is that you have to be able to move through the woods quietly. You have to, and if you got a dog with you, that's going to be an issue. And that was one of my regrets was uh, while I loved having my, my dog for the companionship and just for all the other good benefits, it's hard to keep your dog uh, fed and happy and healthy and have plenty of food and water. And in this world we're living in now, people will kill your dog and eat them. So uh, those are all things that I, I didn't even consider because I didn't think I was going to get separated from my group. So I didn't have nearly enough supplies. I didn't have nearly enough ammo. So a lot of lessons were learned on my part just from going out and going through that, uh, that little failed mission. Because in the end, I came back with less than I left with. I, I, the whole plan was to go out and resupply. Uh, the other two guys, they didn't get anything either. They barely got back with their lives. So it's going to be a real problem for us to resupply and go out and get other things as things run out and they are running out. So uh, just wanted to give you an update and let you know I'm still alive. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to use more than one magazine of ammunition. So I'm real happy about that. Uh, I made it back here. My dog made it back. We're all eating up, you know, as much as we can eat right now, of course, within reason. We still have to ration, but uh, we're trying to put some calories back in and get healthy because, you know, uh, the reality is, is we don't have enough. No matter how much stuff people have in their cupboards and stuff like that, it's never enough. So we're going to have to go out and find other sources. You know, maybe, maybe if we can make it till the spring, we can trade with farmers and stuff like that, that we're prepared. And, but until then, we've got to find, we've got to rely on what is already uh, mass produced and already in circulation. A uh, lot of death, a lot more than I expected. Uh, I've walking down the streets, walking through even the ditches and stuff. I saw several dead bodies. Uh, it's quite disgusting. When you smell that smell from, you know, a hundred yards away, you know exactly what it is and you have to walk past it. It's just, it's pretty ominous. Winter's kicking in full gear. I had a couple of nights where it got down in the 30s and stuff, and it was pretty cold. But most of the days that I was out there, it was in the 50s and 60s, so it was fairly nice. But uh, somebody was saying there was a big cold front coming. Uh, apparently, up north of us, they've had some really, really cold, like 20 degree days and stuff. And so we're getting ready to brace for a big time deep freeze. And so, yeah, anyhow, I don't know how people are going to make it because a lot of these folks, I mean, 25 houses in the neighborhood and only a few, I think when we counted them, it was like four or five houses that actually had wood stoves and fireplaces. So not very many, uh, wish we'd have thought about that before the shit hit the fan. Anyways, I hope you guys are doing better than we are out there and I hope you prepared and you have a big wood pile and a big wood stove to sit by through this cold winter and you have plenty of things put up uh, because it could clearly be that dark winter that that one guy was talking about uh, before everything went to hell.